This is Swarfcast. I'm Noah Graff. I am very honored to be with Josh Shapiro, owner of JN Shapiro Watches in LA, California. LA, California. Welcome to the show, Josh. Nice to be with you, Noah. Yeah, this this is great. I met Josh, I don't know, six months ago or a year ago. I can't remember. He bought an L20 Citizen, an old L20 Citizen from Graf Pinkert. Maybe maybe we'll mention that during the interview. But uh, let's jump into uh, what you guys do. So first, explain your company, JN Shapiro. All right, so we make high-end luxury wristwatches. We're one of the very, very few companies in the United States that manufacture watches. We started out just making the faces of the watches. Uh, our expertise was with something called guilloche, which is doing engraved geometric shapes on the faces of watches. And that's done using non-motorized, very old school machines. They're really special. And then from there, we moved on to making our own cases. And now we are very close to having our first prototype uh, completely in-house movement done. So it's an exciting time. So the entire watch then would be Correct. made in-house. Wow. Correct. I just want to just, this is just going to be brief. And then we're going to, I want to break into your story a bit, but how much, how much does some of these watches cost? Well, our Infinity series, which is now sold out, you know, those ranged anywhere from thirty to forty thousand, uh, depending on case material and customizations. This next line will be seventy thousand and up. Wow! Yeah, <laughs> congrats! A lot of money. I can't afford my own watches. <laughs> well, one day you will. One yeah. day, Josh. Uh, I want to know a little bit about you now. Um, how did you get into this business? I think there's, you know, we, we did a little pre-interview and there's a really great evolution to how you, how you got into watches and mechanical stuff and you've got machining in your blood, correct? Yeah. So my, my grandfather started a machine shop, uh, in 1947 here in Southern California. And I, uh, you know, that morphed into a sandblasting business, which my father took over. And I kind of grew up at the shop, playing in the machine shop, uh, tinkering with things. Uh, it was wonderful. They had a giant yard full of old machinery, and I'd spend my summers climbing all over it and discovering things. It was a really wonderful childhood there. And uh, I just had a love of old things, so I ended up becoming a history major becoming a teacher. Uh, and then I walked into a local watch store here in Los Angeles called Feldmar when I was about 25 and just fell in love with watches. Did they, started... did they, did they pressure you or did you feel pressure to go into the business or? Did... You know, like uh, my dad was pretty good with that. He was fine with me pursuing a career in history and education. He thought that was great. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so he was very supportive. He would have supported me in whatever I wanted to do. Did you um, feel like a little pull or somebody's got to, you know, carry on the the family business or you didn't feel like that at all? It's just I'm doing uh, my own thing. A little bit. I, I did feel it a little bit, but, yeah, that's that's not the way things went. And yeah, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> no, it sounds and it sounds like things have gone full circle so you sandblasting's a dirty business <laughs> yeah literally yeah <laughs> that kind of business that would be on like dirty jobs or something right exactly yeah you majored in history and then you eventually became a, a teacher or a principal or yes i was a teacher well before that i was I was a coach. I was actually a pole vault coach for a, num a number of years, um, but that so didn't you, pay anything. I, so I you did it, pole vault in college? Yes, in high school and college. That's interesting. I've never met a pole vaulter. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great sport. It's a really a lot of fun. So I did that as long as I could. 
but it, it, it paid nothing, but it was a wonderful job. And then I became a teacher and rose up the ranks and became a, a principal. And while I was a teacher and principal, I was doing watchmaking as a hobby. And then around 2015, I purchased uh, a really nice set of guilloche or engine turning machines. And that allowed me to do professional level work. And I started producing watch faces, watch styles for other watchmakers and started thinking about in the back of my head of launching my own brand. But that's when things started getting serious. And around 2018, the summer of 2018 is when I launched my first series. Um, and that's when I started really reducing my role as a principal until finally leaving in two years ago, completely. Two, two years ago. So as I remember, you said that um, watches and engine turning, that was like a, a hobby for, for 10 years. And then you've been a, a professional for five years. Can you explain that? Yeah. So, you know, I started getting into watchmaking in 2011 and, you know, I was taking some coursework, distance learning coursework with the British Horological Institute, but I was doing it as a hobby. I was taking apart watches. I was skeletonizing them so you could see all the wheels and pinions and uh, escapement inside of a watch. Then I started discovering dials and guilloche. But like I said, in 2015 is when I started really getting serious and thinking about it as a, a way to make money. It was about four years, four or five years doing it just for fun and then starting to get more serious with it. Wait, uh, you might have mentioned it already, but what was the inspiration for for getting into the watches? You know, I, the, one of the first watches I saw was a skeleton chronograph watch. And there was just so much going on there. It was so fascinating to me. Um, watches are really a, a really mechanical watches are a really beautiful thing. It's it's wearable jewelry that's functional and is fascinating. Just how the gear train flows together, how the escapement functions, the pendulum, just the whole interplay of all the the different pieces of a watch are really, really fascinating. Both just to sit and look at and enjoy and enjoy the, the micro craftsmanship. But it's also really fun to work on. It's really, really satisfying. Like uh I think the reason why mechanical watches are so popular now is that so many men are so far removed from actually physically making anything with their hands. I have over a hundred customers. I don't think any of them besides the doctors make their living using their hands. They're all lawyers or entrepreneurs or middlemen, but no one's actually sitting and crafting anything. So I think they kind of, vicariously live through uh, me and my brand and my watchmakers as a result. That's uh, so interesting. It's really fascinating. Yeah. So it's, it's not just a status thing, I guess not yet because, you know, I mean, it's, you're not like world renowned yet. So it's more like this is an incredible piece of machinery and, and beautiful. And that's what makes somebody. Yeah. I say we actually, We've grown a lot in the last few years. So we do, like I have customers all over the world and we have media all across the world, but we're still, you know, independent watchmaking is still a, a niche. It's nowhere near the levels of like the big boys like Rolex and Omega, but um, more and more people are getting into the independent watchmakers um, like myself and other brands. They've had a huge growth in popularity, especially as, more and more people have gotten into the hobby and with Rolex being much more difficult to get their watches, that has caused a lot more brands to pop up. Explain that. I don't know anything about that. The Rolex. Rolex has created a, well, they, they claim they're, they have, um, they're having a difficulty producing their watches, you know, but in reality, they're just creating an artificial scarcity to <laughs> pre-sell out all their watches. Um, and they've done that very successfully. But I can't complain because it's fantastic to me, for me. Like the harder it is for people to get these generic brands, the the more consumers start looking for other things. And then they discover independent watchmakers like myself and other friends I have. 
and it really allows the the market to grow. So it's it's a good thing. It's good for Rolex. It's good for everyone else. Very interesting. So tell me a little bit. You you are very as as you've just hinted at here. I mean, you're very technical. You're very into the production of stuff. Um, you know, you bought an old citizen from us, not, <laughs> not to use, um, to actually make stuff, but to, to train on. Um, yeah. so you're buying some incredible toys. Uh, they're not toys. I mean, but they're, you see, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're, you're passionate yeah. about these machines and they sound really cool. Um, I want you to talk about engine turning. Yeah. I, I don't know if that many people are familiar with that term. Yeah. So I suggest anyone that's looking this up to Google a Rose engine machine. Um, it's a really, really beautiful machine. The concept is there are cams made out of bronze on the spindle of the machine, essentially. And those cams are rocking uh, against the stop. And so as the spindle's turning, it's creating these geometric patterns. And then you can phase the cam independent of the workpiece, and you can create these really beautiful geometric shapes. It's an old art. Um, engine turning machines were around around the same time that lathes came into existence. So what, mid 1800s? No, older than that, 1500s. Oh, okay. Right, because they were making clocks way back yeah. then, right? Yeah, so these machines were really special though and really expensive. Like for instance, like a rose engine machine in the 1700s cost as much as an entire village would make in a year. Um, <laughs> yeah. So these were really specialized machines and they weren't really applied to watches and watch faces until the late 1700s. Uh, before that, they were used in other aspects of jewelry and they would continue. Guilloche is lots and lots of things have guilloche on them. Most famously, the Fabergé eggs. Uh, they have guilloche engraved all along these eggs and then there's enamel on top of them. Mm. Um, so the machines can do quite a lot of different things. And um, I have a number of them. Um, the first one I bought, you know, I scrapped together every cent I had to afford it. Then, uh, then I ended up selling uh, that set of machines and buying another set of machines. How much did the how in. much did it all cost? You know, like the the second set of machines cost me around thirty thousand dollars. And I didn't have that much money, so I had to sell my 67 Mustang Fastback uh, to afford <laughs> it. Um, and the machine prices, that was seven, eight years ago. The machine prices have only gone up and up and up um, because they're rare antiques that were produced over 100 years ago. There's only one maker of Rose Engine machines today. His name's David Lindau. He'd be a really fascinating person for you to interview as well. And then there's another type of the same machine called a straight line machine. Rose engines do circular guilloche. Straight line engine turning machines do vertical engine turning. Um, and I have a number of those machines as well. I have seven engine turning machines. I have one of the largest collections in the country. It's and, and that's and that's essential to do the stuff you're doing. Uh, it was important to me, like most watch brands don't have any guilloche on them at all. Um, and then the ones that do, most of them are doing it with CNC machines or stamping. And then you have a very few companies that actually have Rose engines and straight line machines that do it by hand like we do. Is Rolex using that? Was that? What does Rolex use? Does Rolex use those? When Rolex does guilloche, which is very rare, they're doing it with CNC machines. Hmm. it's it's a one at a time method you know you're working on one dial at a time that can take anywhere from a few hours to you know a week to do one of these watch faces on on these machines so it's uh yeah. it's very manually controlled okay so you have seven of them 
And are you still using that or have you replaced that with some CNC machines? No. So we still do that and we always will because with these really high end watches, you kind of pick and choose what you want to do automatically with a CNC machine and what you want to do by hand. And so guilloche is one of the things that we always want to do by hand. It's the difference between having an original painting by an artist versus a photocopy of it, a print. Interesting. Yeah. So my collectors really appreciate that I sat down and, you know, put a week's worth of time creating this watch face by hand. It makes the watch really, really special. And how much is it being done by um, by you or your staff? You have, what, six, seven people? Yeah, so it's me plus seven now. I've taught everyone in the company how to do engine turning. Um, everyone has, like I have one trained CNC machinist. I have another watchmaker that has turned into a CNC machinist. Um, I have three other watchmakers that are doing various watchmaking tasks and manual machining tasks. I have one person who is a trained jeweler who uh, has pursued a whole career in hand engraving. He's an incredible hand engraver um, and one admin. So everyone has a really great uh, skill set um, and really enjoys making things. And there's a lot of overlap in skill and it's really great. So yeah, so some, I don't do all the engine turning anymore. I used to. Um, and as the company grows, I'm doing more and more business development and running the business. And unfortunately, less and less uh, actually making things. But I really enjoy both. So I'm happy. Right. You're still the visionary. Uh, how, how much of the design are you behind? All of it. All of it. I'm deeply involved. Like, uh, I'm a pretty good user of CAD, we use SolidWorks. The other guys in the company use Fusion 360. On our newest project, I worked with a friend of mine who's like an expert at SolidWorks. So he's just a lot faster than me. So we'll just sit down together and design the watches together and he can just fly. You know, he's, you know, I, I'm a, a little bit of a jack of all trades. So it's nice working with someone that's just, you know, spending 10 hours a day on SolidWorks and knows it back and forth that's so cool that it's a combination of the guilloche of something hundreds of years old mm -hmm. and and solid works um yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. if only if only they could see you know 500 right. years ago yeah well, we have our stray line and rose engine machines right next to our cmm um okay so it's like a, it's a little bit of a trip. You know, we have a measuring machine that can measure down to a micron right next to machines that were pre-electricity. <laughs> That's cool. Um, and so what are the other, what are the, some of the new machines you're, you're getting? I guess I'll just go in order of the machines we got. So first, my first big CNC machine was, uh, that we still have was um, a Haas office mill. Um so that's actually a great watchmaking machine. And there's a lot of people in Switzerland that have these Haas office mills because they're really, really accurate. People in High Switzerland are using Haases? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Some of the biggest uh, uh, independent watchmakers are using Haas, which is really cool because they're made here, right in Southern California. Yeah, so Haas office mill. And uh, they picked up a second one. Then we got um, a Harding HLVH, which is like the premier uh, tool room lathe. It's not a CNC machine, but you know it was. We got it restored by Paul Babin, who's a great restorer of these HLVHs. It's just an amazing, amazing lathe. I assume I can I can talk talk about these machines, and people that are listening are are going to get the references right. This is. This is machinists some, tuning in. <laughs> some of them, some people. Yeah. Okay. But that's okay. I mean, you can explain a little bit, and they'll, I mean, they'll get it. A lot of the people, yeah. Yeah. That's okay. It, Either way, the HLVH is an amazing machine. We use it for tons of fixtures and jigs. You know, it's one of those legendary U.S. machines that you can put a quarter on its side on top of the the headstock, 
and it doesn't move when the machine's on it. So vibration free, wonderful machine. Um, and then, um, then we purchased a Shoblin 102 TM. Uh, we have a number of manual lathes made by Shoblin and Levin. Levin is another U.S. company out here in Southern California. They made watchmakers lathes and they switched to aerospace. But we have a number of those machines. We have another manual Shoblin machines. Then we picked up a, a CNC Shoblin machine. And that was our first CNC lathe. It also has a vacuum chuck on it, which is really amazing. So you can hold extremely thin flat stock um, right up against the vacuum uh, chuck and be able to turn it and work on it, which is really nice for holding really thin things. Mm -hmm. Then we picked up the, the L20 from you. That was to practice on before we got our new shiny L12, which is getting here Wednesday. So we're really excited for that. Um, and then the big, big machine that we got this year was we got a Kern Evo. Kern is makes the most accurate milling machines on the planet. It's a submicron machine. We don't, we can't measure submicron here in our shop, but it's nice to know that we're working with a machine that's that accurate, that precise. And it's the first Kern Evo used for watchmaking in the U.S., which is really exciting. And interesting. Yeah, Kern's been fantastic to work with too. I was at IMTS and I went to the Kern booth and I had known that you had the Kern. And I said, um, yeah, you know, I know a guy and he's makes watches. He's got a Kern and there. Somebody's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then the other, the, then this other guy comes, I think, I don't know, maybe it was a guy from Switzerland or whatever. And then another guy comes over and he's like, oh, is it Josh Shapiro? And I was like, <laughs> yep. It's just, yeah. they probably don't sell that many of them, right? So. Yeah, that was Tony. Tony's the head of uh, Kern out in the US. Uh, I think he's from Germany and he really knows his stuff. He's a really incredible person to work with. Mm -hmm. It's made in Switzerland or Germany? Germany. Oh, Germany. Okay. Yeah. I want to talk um, a little bit about, you know, building your brand. It just seems like really hard. I mean, you've got, you've got to create this scarce, this luxury item, this, you know, it's like, who's Josh Shapiro? Why should I buy one of those watches? And why should I buy <laughs> um, and pay a bunch of money for it? Uh, sure, it's pretty, but there's a lot of ones. So, how do you start doing that? So, first, you got a great product. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, what I did was so there's the, the art of guilloche. There are some patterns that are easier to do, and there are some patterns that are more difficult to do. So, I got really good at doing the most difficult patterns. And then from there, I invented a new pattern that was extremely uh, challenging to do. We call it the infinity weave. It's a basket weave within a basket weave. We're making lines that are 0.3 millimeters long. Do you have anything, uh, any, any I, watches with you right now that you can show where, where you're doing that? Yeah. So I can show you, you won't be able to see it through the video, but there's a lot of great pictures online. This is one of our watches. So the, the face of the dial has all this fine engraving on it. And in the sub dial where the seconds hand is, is where the, uh, the infinity weave is. And I call this the infinity series. It's sold out now. So um, it's a weave inside a weave. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So basically it's me engraving absolutely tiny lines in a very small area, very, very small area. This is a customer's watch that he dropped off to us to give him blue screwed, blue screws instead of. So color. this is something that nobody else was doing. Uh, and you could go and brag about it more or less that. So that's one thing you could do to. It's an area of watchmaking that very few people are doing already. And th there's almost no American watchmakers. It's it's a tiny, tiny, tiny market here in the U.S. We used to have a huge watchmaking, manufacturing production here in the U.S., and that all died in the 60s. We went from millions of watches to zero 
of mechanical watches. Specifically. Why did it die in the 60s? Just because of technology and people were just like, oh, I can get a cheap watch. And No, um, I'm actually going to give a whole lecture on this soon. It's like one of my passions. But in short, the watchmaking industry was like the forefront of technology in the U.S. until World War II. After World War II, there was a huge brain drain in the watch uh, making um, world, specifically in the United States, where all these watchmakers and people that were trained with working for with tiny little components went into all sorts of different industries that were popping up post World War II. So a big brain drain. The other aspect of it was in Switzerland, um, watchmaking like there were centers where like one company would be in charge of just making wheels and another completely separate company would be in charge of cases and another company in charge of hair springs versus in the United States, you'd have one company like Hamilton that would do everything uh, under one giant factory. And that was great because they didn't have to worry about suppliers, but it meant when new technologies in the watch world came out, like automatic winding or chronographs for which wa wristwatches, the Americans were very, very slow uh, to adapt to that. Um, and then the other nail in the coffin for American watchmaking um, was tariffs. They were very favorable tariffs to the Swiss. So the Swiss were able to flood the US market uh, with their watches. And it was very difficult for the United States to compete. And then lastly, there was a big switch in the 50s post-World War II from watches being a tool watch, a watch you needed to tell the time, and that's why most people wore a watch, to in the 50s and 60s. Uh, they had iPhones. Well, yeah. <laughs> no. In the 50s and 60s, um, you know, people started having more spare time. They started having hobbies like racing and you know, James Bond and diving and all these hobbies. So watches became more than just a tool watch. They also became a way to feel cool, just like muscle cars were, you know, uh, a watch was more than a watch. It was like your thing to make you feel like an adventurer or a cool person. And Rolex and Omega really capitalized on that. And the United States completely missed the boat on that. Um, and all these factors together, just caused the the industry to collapse. So as a result, there's been a really large void until the 21st century where a lot of brands have started to take up watchmaking in the United States again. Nowhere close to where we were before. Um, and most of us are using movements from Switzerland. So what does that mean? Uh, what does that mean, a movement from Switzerland? So like a movement is the, the guts of a mechanical watch. It's everything inside of it, just like a car engine uh, and transmission. So there are some brands in the United States that, you know, do cases and dials. Some purchase everything from Switzerland. It's just di designed in the United States. Like Shinola watches, you know, they, they're they importing a good chunk of all their stuff. They got in trouble with the FTC for saying it was American made. And uh, so slowly, slowly more is being done here. So our watch that we're working on is the first time since the 60s that everything, all the parts, all the little parts, everything are made in the United States. So you haven't done one yet. This is the one that's coming. Yeah, I mean, we're we're very, very close. <laughs> so how, how, right now, if you were to buy a watch from you guys, what is it about 80% made in the U.S.? So the old series we were doing, the Infinity series that we sold out on, you're we making the case, the hands, and the dial. Uh, so not the, the movement of the watch. And that was according to plan. Like I, I did the Infinity series to be able to have the funding to be able to grow the company enough to be able to make the movement. So people make the mistake of trying to do the movement, which is the most difficult thing right off the bat. And if it's not a critical success, then they're out of business. Um, so I try to do it bit by bit and build up to it. Do you feel like by doing the movement that enables you to sell the watch for more money? Or is it more like this is something intrinsic for you? And this is that you're conquering one of your own personal goals. Well, it's both 100%. Like, uh, I'm a professional. I have to 
have to pay the bills. In a, in a perfect world, I'd sit by myself and make a watch all by myself. And if food and sustenance fell from the sky, then uh, I wouldn't worry about it. But it was always my goal to make a, a complete watch here in the United States. Um, that's always, always been the goal. And it wasn't, um, and that wasn't based on, you know, being rich or anything. That was like, a... yeah. I mean, when I got into this in 2011, I picked up a book called Watchmaking, written by George Daniels, and it's a book that goes step through step on how to make a wristwatch, every single part of it. And it's it's daunting, and it's not like, you know, you have to have a lot of equipment. He was doing it all manual, like using manual machinery, but even then, it's still, you know. 50 to a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment and becoming an expert in it all. So there's no easy way to make a, a watch from scratch in any shape, way, or farm, uh, form, just like there's no easy way to make a car engine. Um, so it's the same type of thing. Uh, so yeah, I've been building up to it this whole time and it's really exciting to finally be there. Okay. So um, that's one thing that's, you know, should be able to build your your brand some more but and you've got you know the uniqueness of being you know the most the american watchmaker with the most parts made in the united states how do you make your product you know the one that everybody should get i mean they all do the same thing uh yeah tell the time they all yeah. tell the time um they're all beautiful but so much of it if if i understand correctly is just based on status and status can build upon itself and um how do you how do you how do you how do you get how do you get there yeah yeah that's part of it but um i guess the best example is like if you look at the car world if you look at the car world you know you you can buy a toyota or honda and it'll get you from point a to b And you can also buy a McLaren and it'll get you from point A to B. Um, And from the outside observer, they'll say, okay, the McLaren looks cooler um, and rich people buy it. So maybe it's just, you know, that's the only special thing. Like, okay, it looks cool and rich people buy it (laughs) and that's it. But, you know, then you get into the engine, you know, Um, you know, the car goes fast, um, very, very fast. So there's a ton of engineering that goes into the car to make it be able to do that. And then the quality of the parts that are in the car at a much higher level than a car that's mass produced. And it's the same thing for a watch. Mm-hmm. So the it tells the time, but the quality and time that we put into each and every one of the parts is astronomic. Like there's hand finishing that goes into it. Like, you know, when you're machining, you usually chamfer the edges of a part so it doesn't cut you. But in watches, we make that a decorative part of it as well. Like we finely polish those bevels and chamfers. Mm-hmm. Uh, we decorate the movements. Every part of the movement is decorated to make it both functional and beautiful. Um, so a tremendous amount of time goes into these watches. And then we also try to make them as accurate as possible, which is comparable to how fast a car goes. So we're trying to make the watch chronometer status, which means, you know, it's plus or minus two seconds a day, which is uh, very, very accurate for a watch that has nothing to do with electricity inside of it. Right. Um, so this is probably a dumb question, but like if you compare it to the time on your iPhone, which one is more quote unquote accurate? Uh, the time on the iPhone, 100%, because the iPhone is tied to atomic clocks that are accurate to tiny fractions of a second. But watches are, are more than that. You know, like it's it's something that will last hundreds of years. It's a piece of art, um, and it's functional art that you can wear on your wrist. Yeah. So, it, it you know, art is the, the spice of life. You know, it's not something that's necessary for you to eat um, or live, but it's what makes our civilization special. Um, beyond just being like a toy for wealthy people, you know, when someone sees a work of art 
uh, it's inspiring. And that's what we do with our watches. They're more than just time telling advice that devices they're they're works of art that we really put our hearts and souls into. And then they're also mechanical too. So that's a great yeah. way of of demonstrating that. So then what's the secret to educating people that you do that? Yeah, so social, social media, getting written up in the right things. Most of my media that's out there is already in the watch world. There's a tremendous amount of watch media that exists. Watches are extremely popular, you know. Tens if not hundreds of millions of people collect nice watches um, at various different levels. And so there's a lot of watch media out there. And usually what happens is someone gets like uh, into watchmaking, you know, buys their first mechanical watch and then they'll start exploring that world and seeing what else is out there. And um, eventually they'll discover brands like myself and there's whole like collector communities, there's collector groups, just like there's car clubs, there's watch clubs. Um, you know, I'll often be featured when I come out with a new watch or a new limited edition uh, in a lot of these watch magazines or watch blogs that have hundreds of thousands and millions of readers. So that's that's where my customers come from, from Instagram, word of mouth, all these things. So I don't actually do any paid advertising and actually haven't ever um than any paid advertising it's all from exposure and word of mouth yeah do you feel like if you did do paid advertising that would sort of cheapen it in a way no um no it's, it's a good question it's a good question there would definitely be a stigma attached to it if i went to commercial that would lose some of the charm i believe yeah. Like, uh, you know, we really are a small team and, you know, we're doing something very special and unique. So if we started doing like very commercial syndicated type advertising, that would give us more of a Rolex Omega type feel like that it's more of a business than a passion. I think that's how uh, it would be interpreted. You're you're serious about this as a business. I mean, you buy you know, equipment that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, I'm assuming you want to scale it bigger than it is right now. Yeah, I do. But slow, steady growth, at least for, for this brand, what I'm doing here, like uh, the labor is highly specialized. Like there's very few watchmaker watchmaking schools in the country. Um, and within the watchmaking schools, they may graduate 10 people. And only one or two of them would even be qualified to work with me to do what we're doing. Did you go to a watchmaking school? I did a distance program. I was already a teacher and had a family and was settled here when I got into it. So I couldn't pick up and go to one of the watchmaking schools. The schools are in Seattle, Lidditz, Pennsylvania, uh, Dallas, Texas, and right. Miami. Uh, there's no school in Los Angeles. Um that's on the bucket list for me to do later. <laughs> so you don't have you don't have to go to watchmaking school to to do what you do, but it's helpful. Yeah, it's really helpful. It's really helpful. And uh, you know, like when I started getting into guilloche and machining, my skill level in watchmaking just plateaued from that point. Cuz watchmaking there's understanding how a watch works and being able to repair and service a watch. And that's mostly what people are going to school to do. And mm -hmm. then there's actually manufacturing parts, which they touch on in watchmaking school. And the watchmakers I want to hire are the ones that were fascinated by both aspects of it. Not just the guys that want to just sit and service all day long. Um, I need the guys that want to make. Take a tiny piece of metal and start making it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Do you have any advice for somebody somebody who wanted to get into either watchmaking or some other kind of product that's based on not only craftsmanship, but status, scarcity, cachet, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I there are two bits of advice that I always try to, to live by. One is learn from every single person you meet, whether it's a 
you know, I've learned so much just from talking to old time machinists to, you know, people that are, you know, like I, one of my mentors is the person that built a gigantic pie business, you know, like, you can learn something from absolutely every person you meet that can, you can apply for your own business in your own life. Wow. So I always, always, always try to do that. And the other thing, um, David Lindau, who I mentioned before, when I got into Giyashe, he gave me really great advice. He said, there are two types of craftsmen. Those that start doing something and say, Oh, wow, I'm really good at this. My work's really great. Um, and usually the work's not, usually it's awful, but, <laughs> uh, the other type of craftsman is someone that looks at their work and says, okay, I got a lot to learn. I got a lot to grow on this. And so I always try to keep that growth mindset that whenever we make anything, whenever we do anything, whenever I work on something, I always try to think of ways I can improve upon it. Um, and that way I never get stuck. The, the second you think you've done something that's perfect and there's no room for improvement is the second your growth stagnates in whatever field or pursuit you're doing um so always having that growth mindset always thinking how can i do things better how can i improve wow how much do the watches cost uh it was 30 to forty thousand, depending on the case material and the new ones are seventy thousand and up seventy thousand and up yeah so it's not... a reference so it's not like this is the set that's 30 and this is the set that's 70. They they range in between those. Well, not anymore. Now the, the new series that we're going to launch soon, it's $70,000 and up from there, um, up to about 85,000, depending on material and customizations. Um, so they're very expensive, but we put in about 400 to 500 hours on each timepiece. Um, that's so much time goes into making each one of those watches. So that gives you an idea of how much labor is involved. There are a lot of watch companies that rely on their marketing and status uh, for the price tag. And maybe the manufacturing value of the watch is a few thousand and they're charging a hundred thousand. Uh, and they're able to do that from their advertising and whose risk they've been able to get it on. Um, but with our watches, the the manufacturing cost is a lot closer to the cost that someone's paying. We're not um, padding it. Uh, and like, that's not the way we're doing business. You're not, you're not paying for uh, fluff. It's our time. Right. No pun intended. <laughs> that's, that's very interesting. I mean, in my opinion, I don't exactly have a problem with charging extra um because you know more more in relation to what your labor is i mean because there's a lot more to it than just labor as you know i mean there's the intellectual yeah. property and there's that it's it's a piece of art and so uh, yeah. obviously just you know somebody commissions an artist to do something it's not like they're the painting is based on being paid by the hour. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous, right? I'm sure you've yeah. you know, consider this as well. I mean, right. There's just levels of extreme with it, I guess. Like um, there's hype and there's reality. Um, and I like to base my product in reality rather than uh, like the hype aspect of it. So would you care, would you be happy if you could somehow get it on a celebrity wrist and get publicity that way? Or, or is that not the way you would want to build your brand? Um, I mean, you know, we we're limited in the production we can do. So like sales are super important. Like I, I don't need that in order to generate sales. In other words, like some watches, like they rely on getting their watches on celebrity wrists in order to make sales. Yeah. Um, that's how they need to do that to, to operate. So I don't need to do that. Like I have some watches on some very important wrists, but I didn't do that on purpose. Right. But eventually you do want to keep scaling to some extent. I mean, you don't want to be. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Always want to be going. I mean, you have to, in any business, you have to, the second you stagnate, 
it's like a escalator. If you're standing still, you're you're really going down. So you, you always got to be trying to grow. Okay, uh, just a couple more questions, and then I'll I'll just have you hold up a couple watches, and you can explain that, and then then you'll be done with me. Uh, <laughs> this is great. I'm really enjoying it. Oh, good, good. Now I know there's so many things we talked about before. Just um, I, I, you are just your background is fascinating, and I I think you know the direction of the interview has been appropriate with the the nuts and bolts but there's there's a lot to josh shapiro and and well everybody but he's got a very interesting story prior to doing the watches in any case uh what's something that you learned this week about about anything it doesn't have to do with watches or or something that struck you emotionally hmm that's a deep question. Uh, I've made a lot of friends uh, in this industry, and uh, that's been one of the, my favorite parts about this, either with my customers or colleagues that I've met. Like, uh, I feel very lucky that I have like a large network of people that I can call on and just talk yeah. to about all sorts of different things. It's a beautiful thing. I feel the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Like when I was in the education world, like there really wasn't much of that. You know, it was when you're in the education world, you're dealing with educators, you're dealing with teachers, you're dealing with other administrators. Mm -hmm. Being in a world where I'm selling things, I'm selling to people that are in all sorts of different careers. And then being in manufacturing, the manufacturing world is absolutely massive and gigantic. So I can sit down, like I said, and talk to someone that was manufacturing pies and we can talk about different types of equipment. And then I can go and talk to someone else about, you know, manufacturing weapons or manufacturing medical devices. And it's very, very different. But and they're like often a... the same people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so uh, it's just it's just really nice or like. I end up talking to a lot of people in the watchmaking world too. all different, you know, some people that are working in service centers, others that have their own businesses, repairing clocks and, or other people that are doing it as a hobby. Like um, one person I've talked to a lot and sold equipment to, you know, he works in defense and watchmaking is his hobby. You know, it's a, it's a really amazing world out there. People often get very cynical you know, doom scrolling and news and all that, but Ugh. there's so much good and interesting things out there. So many people that are good people doing really fascinating things. And it's just really wonderful getting to meet and know these people. Wow, fantastic. Yeah. You must be so, so grateful about that. Yeah. What, when you think of happiness, what, what does that make you think of? Yeah, I mean, uh, I went to UCLA. So uh, uh, UCLA had Coach Wooden, John Wooden. He had a very uh, specific definition of what success uh, is and kind of happiness growing out of that. And success is, in short, fulfilling your potential, making sure that you're putting in each day to to reach your potential. He has like a whole pyramid of success. I have it hanging up in my office right behind where I'm talking to you. I need to look that um, up right after we get off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's it's amazing, and he used that whole philosophy for his basketball team, and it was what made his basketball team so uh, able to win so many championships. Uh, I didn't want to say successful because uh, he always said whether they won or lost, he didn't want the he didn't want you to be able to tell by looking at his players. Like being successful was how they played and how well they executed what they had practiced. Um, the score was just a byproduct of that. Um, so that's what happiness is for me when I know I'm living up to my potential, uh -huh. that I'm I'm being the person that I want to be. I'm putting in the work that I know I'm capable of doing. Um, that's what makes me happy. And same with my family too. You know, like you know, I have uh, three kids. I know you're a family man. There's a tremendous amount of joy just being around your family and having children and relationship with your wife. And um, that's a lot of inherent joy. Um, right. 
And it's a different kind also, of success. Yeah, it's also success. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But then, you know, like, I, I feel like being a family man, it's also the same thing too. You know, like being the best father that you can be brings a tremendous amount of joy and happiness. It's not so different from running a company either. You know, like, you know, a, a company is a family. Um, it's all about the relationships. Some are dysfunctional. Some are, (laughs) some are so, 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 so. (laughs) yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate this interview. It was, it was, it was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you too. It really was awesome. Thank you. 